gentlemen. Thank you very much uh, to the Australian National University for having invited me for this year's uh, K.R. Narayanan uh, oration. K.R. Narayanan was uh, one of the most distinguished uh, diplomats and civil servants that India produced. He came uh, from a background which reflected uh, historically the disadvantaged groups in India. He grew up amidst all odds and turned out to be one of the extremely brilliant uh, diplomats that India produced and eventually went on to become the president of India. Uh, on a personal note, uh, I happened to work closely with him when he was the president because uh, I was sworn in as a minister by him for the first time. And uh, as a law minister in the government at that time, uh, I had to deal with the president uh, quite uh, regularly. And uh, an extremely sharp mind, uh, uh, a strict constitutionalist, uh, given to rules, good governance, good principles, that's the memory of uh, Dr. K. Narayanan that we all have. And I am indeed privileged to join the list of uh, some very eminent people uh, who in the past have delivered his uh, annual oration itself. I was asked by the university to send a written text uh, of the address, which of course uh, Professor Jaha would need for reasons of publishing. But I've always believed that uh, listening to people read out texts becomes quite challenging. <laughs> and therefore, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not really going to read it out, but uh, refer to some of the uh, basic points which are set out in the text itself. While we speak in terms of uh, reform and growth, in India, a lot seems to have happened in the last two and a half decades. In fact, the Chancellor in his various capacities as a former foreign minister, and even otherwise was mentioning that uh, he's traveled extensively to India, and his initial memories seem to be of the 1968 Indian train, uh, traveling in what was then called the third class compartment. We've uh, come a long way since then. Uh, he did mention uh, my fondness for cricket. And if I go back uh, to where India was in those decades, uh, when Steve was uh, autobiography, when he first made his debut in cricket, uh, he came to India in uh, 1987 to play in the World Cup. And from Mumbai, he, would, he mentions in his autobiography that he would regularly telephone his girlfriend. And the Indian telephone system at that time was that uh, uh, he had to sit next to the telephone uh, the whole night because uh, uh, he'd be added on to what we used to call the trunk call. <laughs> and uh, at some odd hour in the middle of the night, the call would be connected. And while he was speaking to his girlfriend, uh, every three minutes, the operator would say, do you want me to continue the call? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> We've come a long way since then. Today we have, uh, in 1995, our tele density was 0.8%. Less than 1% of Indians had a telephone. So that's just about 21 years ago. Today, uh, it's over 1 billion phones. Uh, and that's only one illustration which uh, demonstrates as to where India has moved on from. An economy which was uh, essentially an economy of uh, shortages. I remember when I first became a member of parliament, the transformation was still taking place. And each one of us used to be given a discretion. And the discretion uh, used to be that we could allocate gas connections to people, we could alloc allot telephone calls to people out of turn. And suddenly within a year or two, I found that nobody would come to me to ask for this favor. 
uh, because we were slowly turning from an economy of uh, shortages to surpluses. And my then leader, the former Prime Minister, Mr. Vajpayee, said that you are only distributing uh, telephones and gas connections. He said that he recollected that uh, in his earlier days as a member of parliament, he also had uh, a discretion to allocate HMT watches to people. <laughs> so they were all allowed uh, uh, two HMT watches every year, which they could allot to people out of turn. And that is how in which the manner in which regulated economy in India had uh, worked. But I must say the direction we followed from 1991 onwards indeed served us well. It improved upon our growth rates. Uh, it improved... Uh, it brought down our poverty levels. Uh, uh, last week, I had an opportunity to deliver an annual lecture at the National uh, Minorities Commission. And I was extremely pleasant with the research I did for that lecture, that the maximum depletion of poverty rates, even amongst the minority communities, took place post-1991. So as India grew and the economy uh, improved, because prior to 1991, we were quite happy and satisfied uh, as an economy with a smaller base, growing at about 2 to 3% every year. And the world would sarcastically refer to this 2 to 3% growth rate as the Hindu rate of growth. And uh, this was uh, incapable of uh, either depleting poverty levels in India or giving enough resources to the state uh, in order to uh, uh, improve the lot of people which had to be addressed. But post opening out in 1991, successive governments did their little bit. Uh, and the present government seems to be taking that to its uh, logical conclusion. But one important aspect uh, of the economic debate has been that have reforms really helped uh, the economically and socially deprived sections of society. And uh, in the initial years, whereas it was uh, for the then governments a little more difficult and challenging to market reforms, because the arguments was that this really has helped businesses, this has helped private sectors to grow, but has it really impacted on the life of those uh, uh, who otherwise have been used to, to living in adverse circumstances. And this includes a very large section of population. We have uh, large sections of uh, uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, which are historically disadvantaged groups. Uh, amongst the backward caste, we have uh, the most backward communities, uh, uh, which didn't have any sources of employment. We, of course, uh, have a, a significant section of the population uh, at one stage, it was more than 50, 50 to 60 percent which lived below the poverty line. We still have a considerable section which uh, uh, leads that life. We have some uh, uh, groups of minorities which have not economically prospered as well as the other groups. And therefore, how has this entirely impacted upon them? Sectorally, if we see the growth of the Indian economy, uh, our services sector seems to be the best performing sector. And uh, even in otherwise a global slowdown environment, uh, our services sector even today grows at about 9 to 10% a year. And that's a very rapid pace of uh, uh, the growth of the services sector. Our manufacturing sector can do better, uh, 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 but it's our agriculture which is the real challenge. And if you look at the inequalities created by the people in the, the, the rural areas, almost 55% of India's population even today is dependent on agriculture. And being dependent on agriculture, the share of agriculture has shrunk to almost below 15% of India's GDP. And that only shows that 55% uh, plus uh, of the population depends on this 15% in some uh, 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 larger or lesser measure Successive governments in India have been following it up. Where do we stand today? Before I come to the subject of financial inclusion, where do we stand today? Uh, in terms of growth rate, uh, uh, it's a challenging situation globally for the whole world. The entire global economy is uh, facing one of its most acute challenges in recent history. Uh, uh, 
and I think uh, the new norm itself uh, is unpredictability. It is not stability. Uh, uh, you, we are not sure how long this phase is going to last. Uh, the oil prices, the commodity prices have hit a rock bottom. Growth rates across the world have been impacted. And uh, just uh, two, 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 two and a half years ago, the Economist uh, did a, a, a bubble uh, economic order which have taken place. Uh, uh, thankfully, have not uh, made that analysis come true. But the eye seems to be a faster growth rate. Are we in India satisfied with this? Uh, well, if you look at how the rest of the world is doing, I think uh, we are rated as the fastest growing major economy in the world. But if we measure it by our own standards, we believe we can do slightly better than this. As the financial year in India ends today, the 31st of March, uh, we hope to finish this year at about 7.6% growth rate. So our basic parameters seem to be doing well. Last year it was 7.2%. Hopefully we'll be able to maintain or even increase, improve upon this figure depending on certain variables in the next year. Uh, our basic parameters, our current account deficit is well under control. Inflation in India quite well under control. Last 16 months in a row, the wholesale price index has been negative. The uh, consumer index has been in the range of about uh, four to five percent at the highest. Uh, the interest rates are slowly coming down. Foreign exchange reserves are the highest uh, ever. Uh, and till about August uh, last year, rupee, e e other than the Swiss franc, were the only, was the only currency uh, which was able to maintain uh, uh, its pace against the, uh, the US dollar. But post uh, the devaluation in China, uh, uh, the rupee go also got somewhat adversely impacted and the parity got uh, 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 somewhat disturbed. With the basic uh, parameters of Indian economy doing well, where do we feel we can do better? Uh, I think uh, there are three or four variables. The first variable, of course, is the, uh, the global tailwinds. Uh, today, the global situation is obstructive to very high rates of growth. Uh, for one, our uh, uh, exports are very adequate, uh, are significantly impacted because uh, global trade itself has shrunk. And therefore, in terms of uh, values, it has shrunk because of the oil prices and the commodity prices. Even if volumes remain the same, uh, uh, in value term, it seems to have shrunk. And therefore, the global situation has adversely impacted on our exports. That is one area of serious challenge that we have. We've had two years of bad monsoon. Uh, fortunately, in Indian history, you've never had three bad monsoons in a row. So on the law of probability, we, 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 we keep our fingers crossed this year. And monsoons, we don't have a food crisis ever in India because we have surplage. But uh, it uh, uh, impacts on the purchasing power of the rural population. And therefore, it has a spiral impact on industry, on manufacturing, on demand uh, in the market itself. So that's an important variable which can add to India's growth itself. Third, of course, is uh, our ability to continue with the uh, reform process uh, and uh, adding to its pace. And the fourth, which is uh, something which hasn't helped the rest of the world, but it has helped us, uh, the low oil prices, particularly the low commodity prices, have helped us because we are net buyers. And therefore, we've been able to save a lot of money on account of particularly the fall in the oil prices and divert that resource uh, 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 into uh, uh, more useful areas of operation. Uh, how do I see the reforms uh, continuing in India? I think India still has a great appetite for reforms. Uh, there is a, a clear realization in India that India, post the 1990s, is a much better country uh, to live in. It's doing much better than it was prior to that. And therefore, there is a larger political consensus that governments, both at the center and the states, uh, continuing with reforms. Reforms uh, uh, unleash energies of Indian. They allow free flow of capital into the country. They uh, remove all forms of restrictions. And therefore, with the strength of uh, the, uh, entrepreneurship, the economy itself is able to grow. So as a part of the reform process, we've uh, 
opened up the economy significantly. Almost all sectors are open to foreign direct investment. In greenfield investment, we are the uh, we have the largest anywhere in the world, which is coming into India. Uh, in the last one year, foreign direct investment itself has increased by 40%. Uh, addition to this, uh, 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 we have uh, uh, we had a bad reputation for not being the best place to do business in. And therefore, we had to reform our systems. And therefore, considerable headway uh, work has been done in this regard, both by the central government, the state's government. And therefore, there is a significant amount of ease which has come in. We've moved up the global rankings. Uh, we had a, a fairly aggressive taxation system, a direct tax system, which we've rationalized now trying to bring down taxes uh, to a global level. I was speaking to my uh, counterparts in Australia. Uh, our taxes are more reasonable than the ones you pay here. <laughs> uh, uh, um, indirect tax, of course, uh, uh, you've been uh, a decade and a half ahead of us. Uh, we are now trying to implement the goods and services tax. And economists do feel that if we are able to implement it over the next few years, uh, a, a successful GST is capable of uh, adding uh, to India's growth story itself. Uh, our main concentration in terms of expenditure now is uh, into rural India because uh, one of the objects of public finance has to be to fill up the pits wherever you find them and uh, 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 of course on creation of physical infrastructure. I think these are two very important areas where public investment has been going. Our infrastructure, uh, uh, almost every part of it, whether it's the railways, the rural roads, the national highways, the ports, the airports, uh, the power sector, I think these are all areas where there is a huge amount of activity and growth taking place these days. And uh, they require a lot of investment, and I quite uh, candidly concede that kind of investment is certainly not available in India. And therefore, we've been reaching out to investors, pension funds, superannuation funds world over to come and invest in India. And by keeping this entire reform momentum on, we intend to, uh, we intend to uh, uh, add to India's growth story. Now, one aspect of financial inclusion, when I spoke in terms of uh, investment in the rural areas is concerned, uh, uh, is to give the benefit of this increased growth to those sections which have so far not received the benefit. So what is our long-term planning about rural India? Uh, President Narayanan's successor, President Abdul Kalam, used to, uh, 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 f his favorite subject for discussion used to be that India must end up giving urban-like facilities to rural areas. Now that uh, uh, may be a great uh, uh, vision, but a very challenging vision to seriously implement. And therefore, as a part of uh, an inclusive growth bringing the rural areas, what is it that is happening? We have 700,000 villages in India. And by 2019, we intend each village being connected by a regular Pakka road. Now, the road program for the villages in India is one of the most successful program. It's a program where every member of parliament is involved in because he, he knows uh, that he has to visit those villages and people then shout at him because they don't have access. Uh, uh, so everybody is involved in that whole process. So this year we've increased the allocation. This is entirely being done by the government. And this year we've increased the allocation between the central and the state government almost three times so that we could expedite this whole process of uh, rural roads. It's a successful program. It's a work in progress. And I think it, it puts in a lot of money into the rural areas. The second thing, out of these 700,000 villages, we found that 18,000 of them were not electrified. And therefore, the Prime Minister has given a call that uh, in the next 1,000 days, all 18,000 have to be individually targeted for electrification. We don't want a single non-electrified village in India. And as I speak to you today, last week, we crossed uh, 5,000 out of these 18,000. And the indications are that we may be able to achieve this target a little ahead of time. 
So electrification of all villages, road access to all villages. The Prime Minister's call for uh, 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 the Clean India, the Swachh Bharat campaign, now speaks in terms of a toilet in every home. So last year we implemented every school in the villages must have a toilet. So that lakhs and lakhs of uh, toilets had to be constructed. We achieved that target 100%. And now there is a huge campaign in which the government is involved. Uh, uh, the World Bank is also partly helping us in the finance. Uh, Corporate India is putting a lot of CSR money into this campaign. And the idea is to make uh, uh, every home in village and where every home is not possible to make collective community toilets available to villagers in the rural areas itself. Housing for all is a very tall camp order. And in the rural areas, uh, 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 for people to go in for regular paka houses is yet one of the other programs which is on. In order to fund the farmer, and bring him into this entire inclusive camp, uh, process, the loan that he takes for his crop, uh, the interest burden on that loan, because of the economic pressures on the Indian farmer, farm holdings in India are very small, uh, uh, is being partly subvented by the central government. Some state governments are also subventing the loan. So in several states, you almost have a negligible interest rate. Uh, because it's partly being subvented by the center or the state government. So that's one area of helping the farmer. The previous government had started the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. In fact, I've added to it. I've amended it partly so that uh, it can also result in some asset creation, particularly in terms of water bodies being created in the villages. And uh, the amounts now being earmarked for it are much larger. So that's another methodology we have uh, of a social inflow, starting from... Uh, Tomorrow, a campaign is now being launched uh, to make sure that the payments that these unemployed people get as a part of the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, as I'll explain in the course of the talk to just now, are directly transferred to their bank accounts rather than the monies first going from the center to the state, from the state to the district, from the district to the panchayat, and then being pilfered before it reaches the farmer itself. Now it's being directly transferred to their bank accounts itself. Now, these are various avenues of uh, funding rural India and empowering rural India, which are on. What is it that specifically the financial inclusion campaign envisaged? Two years ago, we realized that only 58% of the families in India had a bank account. 42% was completely outside the banking network. And the, one of the first programs of the government was to make sure that every family, we have about 250 million families in India, is connected to a bank. So even if you didn't have a balance to deposit money in the bank, it's not merely that people were supposed to come to the banks. The banks hired employees who were called the business correspondents who went from home to home and reached each one of these 42% who were outside the banking system. So those who were opening bank accounts were incentivized by telling them that they would get a, a debit card, they would get uh, uh, a facility of an overdraft if they operated that account, and various incentives were given. And in a period of about three to four months, uh, uh, it, it was a spectacular performance by the Indian banks particularly the banks in the government sector, that we were almost <coughs> able to add the entire population of India. So it would be stray households now who are outside the banking system. As a pattern, everybody has come within the banking system itself. Now the poverty levels are such that almost 73% of these accounts didn't have a single rupee in them. They had no money. So how do you transfer resources to these bank accounts? Now in order to do that, uh, comes the second limb, which is uh, we all government support that goes. It went in terms of giving cheaper products. I think that's the system which is now gradually coming to an end. And therefore, your cash subsidy is directly transmitted to the, to the account of every beneficiary. And therefore, you have uh, the central government, the state governments, the local bodies uh, 
have a large number of support programs in terms of scholarship, widow pensions, old age pensions, uh, 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 minorities uh, scholarship. Now each one of them is now being transferred to these bank accounts which have been opened. So these have become operational and in a period of about two years, today about 75% of these accounts are actually operational. They have money, people operate them, they use uh, 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 the debit card facility which has been given to them. And this has turned out to be one of the most successful programs. Now building on this, we have a database of what is called the JAM Trinity. The JAM Trinity is the J is the Janadhan account, which is supposed to be these bank accounts. A is an Aadhaar card, which I will just explain. And M is those 1 billion mobile telephone connections. So these are the identities people have. We have then created, and now it has got a legislative support in parliament, we have now created uh, an Aadhaar number, which is a unique identity number, which every resident in India has. Now, already about 1 billion people have been allotted this. The percentage of adults is about 98%, though amongst minor children, it's still lagging behind about 67%, and we, we are adding about 5 to 7 lakh people per day. Uh, who get this unique identity. This unique identity has some uh, particular features of the individual, as also uh, every individual is now identified by this number. Now this enables us to identify those who need support. There are a large number of subsidies in India, petrol was subsidized, diesel was subsidized, cooking gas is subsidized, food for poor people is subsidized, uh, fertilizer for farmers is subsidized. So all these state support subsidies, the challenge with regard to these subsidies was that they were unquantified amounts, which was given to an unidentified section of people. So when the scheme started, uh, 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 each one of us, including me, were getting the benefit of a cooking gas subsidy. Now there's no reason why this subsidy should have been made available to people like me. So we started a campaign for eliminating those who don't deserve this subsidy. We had a parallel campaign called Give It Up. People should voluntarily give it up. Fortunately for us, the oil prices fell, so we were able to link petrol and diesel to the market. The cooking gas subsidy now reaches, and if you look at the numbers, the magnitude of the work done, when we opened those Janadhan accounts, uh, 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 the number of accounts which we were able to open were 210 million. 21 crore accounts. So it, it was, and this was all done in a period of about four months. The cooking gas subsidy now goes to the account of 140 million people each month. So do the scholarships and the other pensions and various forms. So these people have some operational balances always available with them. Now this experiment of Aadhaar, now that it has a statutory backing, we intend now using it as a pilot project for fertilizer in the first instance, for food in the second instance, and wherever it is possible, we will see if this can be implemented. On cooking gas, it has given us a subsidy saving of about 25%, which is a considerable amount because that's all a pressure on the revenues of the central government. And this money can be utilized for uh, helping uh, the various people. And in order to demonstrate this point, uh, uh, as I'll explain later, we've added this as a part of the social security campaign. The third thing that we did was to use all these accounts and offer India outside the government is an unpensioned society. Most Indians don't get a pension and the pension plans are very few subscribed to it. It's only government or quasi-government employees who get a pension. So I've been saying from day one that there's a need to make India into a pension society. And some of my proposals, uh, though well-intentioned, run uh, foul of a certain section because people don't realize the consequences of when they have nothing to fall back on. As a result of it, we started offering uh, low-cost insurance policies and extremely low-cost insurance policies. For instance, we have about uh, 130 million people amongst these poor people insured themselves uh, uh, for a two lakh rupees uh, accident insurance. So if a bread earner dies, his family gets at least some subsistence. These are very poor people. 
and uh, the total amount of premium that was to be paid out of these Janadan accounts is only one rupee a month, which was a nominal account. And therefore, to bring people into financial inclusion and social inclusion, I think this is a step which went uh, long further. We similarly brought in uh, uh, a normal life insurance policy, again, reasonably low cost, and a pension scheme for them. The two insurance policies have been a runaway success. The pension scheme is still taking time to register because people have not realized the benefits of those outside the government to have uh, a, a, a pension uh, program for themselves. Uh, I think uh, one day, hopefully, uh, from following from the pattern that you have uh, in countries like Australia, in the United States, and Europe, uh, we probably could uh, insist on people contributing, at least a large section of those who can afford it, contributing for a mandatory pension uh, subsequently. Now, the bank accounts being opened, money is being put into these bank accounts, the facility of uh, insurance is being made available to them, and uh, 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 what do we then do with this large body of uh, people? Uh, many of those who can't get a job either in the government or in the private sector. So the next limb of this financial inclusion, which I started last year, was this is an unfunded section of society. And therefore, you have to encourage them to set up businesses and small establishments on their own. So we started what is called the, the mudra scheme of the government, wherein all the banks were advised to give to them microfinance at the bank rates of interest. Otherwise, these people were entirely dependent on money lenders who were lending to them at 25, 30, and 35% a year. Uh, and uh, this was very exploitative. So this mudra scheme has turned out to be a runaway success. And in this mudra scheme, uh, in the first year, the banks were asked uh, as a priority to earmark a certain amount of their lending and lend small loans up to 50,000 rupees, up to 2 lakh rupees, 5 lakh rupees, 10 lakh rupees on a maximum to this section of people. So somebody would start, uh, a lady in a slum would start a beauty parlor, or somebody would start a boutique, or somebody would become a vegetable vendor, and people started setting up small businesses. So in the very first year, we've been able to support more than about 21, 22 million people already. As the year expires today, I'll probably in the next few days have the final figures for this year. I've rolled over this scheme by increasing the amount by another 50%. So the banks have been this year given, coming year given a larger challenge, and you will have several crore people who get now finance from the bank at the bank rates of interest. Each one of them is given a credit card. They go to the ATM machines. Within that credit limit that they have, they take the money out. And each one of these small uh, entrepreneurs tries to deposit, because these ATM machines are open 24 hours a day, to deposit it before 12 midnight so that they can save even on one day's interest. And uh, this has become uh, 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 a, a massive program of financial inclusion. So from bank accounts uh, to state support, to insurances, to nudging them to go in for pension programs, to now making funds available to them to the banking system. And uh, uh, it's quite heartening to note uh, that in this sector, like in most microfinance schemes, uh, which the banks do themselves or through various microfinance agencies, uh, the bad debt is almost negligible. So these are people who want to actually do business uh, and uh, set up small enterprises and who've been uh, doing these businesses. What are we doing with these savings that we are making out of these uh, subsidy programs? So this year I've announced three schemes. One is entirely state-supported that this entire benefit we got from the cooking backs gas subsidy, we've now planned that 50 million families in India, that's five crore families in India, in the name of the female head of that family, the government would gift them with cooking gas connections. They otherwise use the conventional chulas. And medical studies have shown that a conventional chula can do as much damage to the lady who cooks her health as uh, in a single day, as much as 400 cigarettes can do. And therefore, these uh, women now from the savings 
are being brought into the system and they are being nudged and incentivized that the first connection with them will be free, gifted by the state. We pick up the lowest five crore families in India, which is 20% of uh, India, the bottom belly. And each one has been given. So this saving which we have been able to make by keeping the wealthier people out and excluding the duplicate connections has gone into them. The second area, for the Indian farmer, we've now come out with a very low cost insurance scheme, crop insurance, because if the crop fails, you'll hear stories of Indian farmers being pushed to suicide because they are not able to return the loans. So that he can get back his investment and a little return on that, even if there is a crop failure. So he'll pay 25% of the premium is to be paid by the farmer, 25% by the state government, 50% by the central government, and therefore, any farmer who wants his agricultural uh, crop to be insured has the benefit of that insurance. And the third part of this financial, this monies that we have saved, which we have used uh, for this purpose, is a health scheme which I have announced, which is in two parts. One third of India's population, the lowest one third, will all get at state expense a health insurance which covers hospital charges up to a certain limit of one lakh rupees. Anybody who's a senior citizen in that category will get an additional cover of about 30,000 rupees. And this is an annual uh, uh, insurance policy that they get. And therefore, a crop insurance, a health insurance, uh, crop insurance subsidized uh, partly by the, substantially by the state, a health insurance subsidized entirely by the state, and to the weaker sections, a cooking gas facility given in the first instance entirely by the state. Now, this is the area in which uh, uh, we've been taking India's financial inclusion. The net object of this exercise has been that wherever you grow faster, the state gets more revenue, the state is enriched, and therefore you make your systems in order that in addition to the natural advantage of jobs being created and so on, you are able to use this additional resource to pump up into the areas which need to be supported. The last scheme which, uh, as I go back to India, which we are launching uh, in the coming week, uh, is something called Stand Up India. And Stand Up India addresses two sections of Indian society, and that's the last point I have to make. It addresses the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe, which is the socially disadvantaged groups, and it addresses women. So every bank branch in India, public or private, has been requested to support one entrepreneur from the scheduled caste, scheduled tribes category and one from the women entrepreneur. They will give them a loan up to one crore rupees and create, in the first instance, about 2,50,000 new entrepreneurs coming from these sections which have not actually seen too many entrepreneurs coming up. That's a scheme we intend to launch as a part of this uh, uh, support to the social sector and the financial inclusion schemes that we have. Hopefully in years to come as governments uh, earn more resources, uh, I think the benefit of resource uh, reaching these sectors itself will continue to increase. That's all I have to say and thank you very much. Uh,